the Tampico incident. Uh, the United, United States Sir. Navy was down yeah. by Mexico, mm -hmm. and a few sailors went ashore, mm -hmm. and uh, they incarcerated them. Right. And Wilson was obsessed with it, and the Congress was obsessed with it. He demanded an apology, and they kept the sailors there for a couple of weeks, and finally they let them go. But we were so incensed by it, we sent our troops to Veracruz, and we occupied the city for seven months. Right. But during this time, the German ambassador in the United States sent a telegram mm -hmm. to the ambassador in Mexico mm -hmm. and told him, talk to Hertha, who was the dictator, and let's invade the United States. Mm -hmm. So to offset the feeling in the United States was that we were going to start our invade was start the troops, our troops going over to Germany to declare war in Germany. They wanted to stop that. But they didn't. We didn't. In fact, it incensed uh, Wilson and the Congress so much that three weeks later they declared war on Germany because of this incident. Well, yeah, I, 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 I agree and disagree with you on certain things about that. It's interesting that you're making that point. Any other body? Uh, Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, what I wanted, what I, I would try to bring a little bit of that up in my discussion. What I wanted to bring up was that you know uh, Wilson was a, uh, as I've said in the weeks, was a man who had a moral uh, bag of uh, righteousness of uh, certitude of what was right. He uh, definitely uh, felt that there was a part of human nature that was right, that, 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 that could lead people rationally to, uh, to do the right things, that there was a right and a wrong. It wasn't that he believed that Governments or leaders control the people. And that people could be, if they were taught right, could find the right path to peace. That there was not a, a evil force in men that man could be taught and educated to do the right thing and to remove the leaders that were looking to do the wrong thing, starting wars. He was a romantic, he was an idealist, he was a man of the 19th century. A man who grew up, he was born in 1856, he did not believe that governments uh, and people were inherently looking for war or looking for hatred among people. He felt that there was hatred out there but that love could conquer it. And he believed that. He even believed, but the trouble is that the 20th century came along, the technology to destroy people through technology was much greater than it was in the 19th century. We now had planes, ships, bombs. 
he still believed because he grew up in the English romantic tradition. He was not absorbed with the technical uh, advancement in machinery and in arms and in the multitudes of armies growing together. He, in a way, you would say to yourself, if you, the trouble we are, we have all been born in the 20th century, and we have been born probably during World War II or thereafter, and we have grown up used to mechanical, worldwide warfare. <coughs> We had World War I, but we had World War II, and before that we had the Depression, we had World War I, we've had the Cold War, the uh, threat of instant annihilation by an atomic bomb between Russia and the United States, the Cold War. We've lived in such an insecure world. Woodrow Wilson, when he grew up, did not live in an insecure world. He lived in a secure world. Yes, he was born up in the South, where he saw, as a child, not firsthand, secondhand, the destruction of lots of the South, but he grew up believing that people could live together. He grew up in the 19th century, when there weren't, there wasn't a threat that when you woke up in the morning, you could be bombed out in the afternoon. You could live in a city and be annihilated. He never had that fear. He grew up. So we have to, you say to yourself, why is a man so out of place with reality? Why was he so out of place with reality? It's the reality that we know, not the reality that he knew. And he grew up with a Christian tradition imbibed every day through his father, his Presbyterian minister and his southern way of life. He read the Bible every day, and he never, when he was present, he never questioned his belief that God was leading the way to show people, if they looked hard, where the right path was. But they had to look hard. Because if you look at Wilson, and I think you should, he was, he was like, in, in today, we would say he was in a fairy tale. He was in a fairy tale. He was like Tinkerbell. He was glowing out, glowing out, radiating faith and light in an unreal situation. But because he believed it, he changed the world. He changed the world. Just like probably Ronald Reagan, in my opinion, lived in an unreal world, so did Woodrow Wilson. And yet, both of them changed the world. Because when you're president of the United States, you can change the world. And that idealism, <clears throat> that idealism that he had, did change the world. He did. I've been talking, and I know I haven't been talking about his illness until just about now, but there were four aspects to Woodrow Wilson's presidency. He lived for the eight years that he was president. One was the progressive period when he first became president. Well, he wasn't that much of a progressive. He had been born in the South. He had tradition, but he had been, he had been transformed in New Jersey. And he became a vehicle of the progressive movement in order to get nominated. And he was willing to accept that. And he did make reforms in his first year or two when he was happily married to his wife, Ellen, his first wife. He was, his wife Ellen was, by the way, a beautiful person who tried to temper this man, tried to get him to see other viewpoints besides the viewpoints that he had. She was a very open person and, she, and she, he was very close to her. And a lot of things he did was affected by his first wife's attitudes 
although he himself had a progressive, he was pushed into a progressive mold in order to get elected. In 1912, there was this progressivism that was going through in America, in large part due to Teddy Roosevelt, who was a Republican who had split the party. Then, that was from 1912, 13, he got elected. Then his wife passed away. And he was devastated in 1915, in August 1915. Remember, I'm talking about eight years, from 1913 to 1918. From 19, now the second period of his presidency, he was a very lonely man. He kept abreast of things that were going on in the world, but he didn't have any desire to live because his, he was so infected by his wife. Then there was a third period where he met his second wife, Edith Olin. And that period when he met his wife and married her coincided with his being the hero of America, the leader, the war leader. And if it wasn't for Woodrow Wilson, uh, uh, not the Woodrow Wilson, it was for the United States and Wilson's turnabout, in 1917, turned about to get into the war. He had, he had ran for a re-election in 1916, and he won it because he kept us out of war. There was a war going on for two years, and in, in, a world war that had erupted. Remember, Wilson had never had experience with a world war. Neither did the world. This was a new thing. And that is why I brought up 1909 up there. 1909 was probably the start of the beginning of the insecure world that we now live in today, that is still going on today. From 1909, what was that meeting? That meeting was by Haldane, Richard Haldane, the British British uh, Foreign Minister, uh, British uh, Secretary of, uh, uh, I think he was Secretary of War, Secretary of State, I think he was Secretary of War, visiting Germany and meeting with Kaiser Wilhelm II. And there was a period between 1905 and 1909 where countries were starting to line up against each other. In Europe, the United States was completely away from it. Talking about what happened, but that what happened was that Haldane met with Kaiser Wilhelm, and Kaiser Wilhelm basically, Haldane was convinced that Germany was going to go to war with France and was going to try to conquer Europe. For that visit, Haldane went back to England and said, We have to join the alliance, we have to strengthen the alliance with France that we have. We have, to be, we have to strengthen an alliance with Tsarist Russia because Germany is out to conquer the world and it's joining forces with Austria and hopefully other countries. And Haldane was correct. Kaiser Wilhelm was designing a war. And no one went to the United States. Greenland was the most powerful country in the world at that time. Germany was trying to be the second most powerful. The United States was basically getting stronger and stronger, but it was staying away. 3,000 was isolated. Well, by the end, beginning of when the war started in 1914, Germany and England basically went all on strong because of the war. They've been, who arose as the first for the world power? Woodrow Wilson and the United States. And Woodrow Wilson, by promulgating the belief that there was a right out there, that people he overlooked because all his life he grew up believing that there was a romantic belief in the right of man. He basically felt that if we have a League of Nations, and you got to remember, the League of Nations was not the main thing on his mind. We should remember him for it. The main thing we should remember is they stopped the war. 
that he got the United States into the war, he got the support of the people of the United States to enter the war, and in two years' time the war was ended because the United States had entered the war. And I really do believe that if it wasn't for the United States, and most people do, we, Germany would have, and would have won the war. England war does owe its life to the United States. The U.S. brought in troops, and they fought for a cause, and the troops believed what Eleanor Wilson told them to believe. We're fighting not to take up territory. We're fighting not for the grand, not for the greatness of power. We're fighting for a right, the right, the moral good. And we have to, and really it isn't the German people that are at fault. <coughs> it's German leaders that are at fault. And if we could get a Germany, and we could get an Austria, and we could get their leaders out, the people of Germany, the people of Austria, Will, will appreciate it. And during the time that he made that first promulgation before he entered the war, before he entered the war, he basically got an overture from Germany. From Germany. This is in 1916. 1916. Not 1917, 1916. When Germany was winning the war, the Germany utilized said, Wilson's making a statement not just to the United States. He doesn't consider England the, the, the friend. He doesn't consider Germany the enemy. He says, we are neutral. We are neutral. We are for the right, but we are neutral. He did not cast Germany as the enemy in 1916. He basically, and what did Germany do in response? Germany in his strength rather than in a tactical moves, because Wilson just couldn't recognize tactical moves when he was making moral statements. He could recognize tactical moves at other times, but he couldn't recognize if he's making a moral statement about the goodness we should all end this war. Germany was winning the war, says, you're right, Mr. Wilson, we'll talk with you. It was, a, you know, just like there is this attempt when the two people are talking, well, we'll talk with you, but it was a tactic. But, as the year went on, Germany, Wilson then began to see, then began to see that Germany was using him. But he was so imbued with his belief that there's a moral right, he said to himself, I'll overlook it. And when Germany started to lose the war, and the United States entered the war, Wilson made a turnaround. He basically did that, saying we're fighting this war for humanity. To get rid of these leaders, because there's good in everybody. Basically good, not that good in that people can find the good. This, to our way of thinking, it's a little like Jesus on the Mount. It's beautiful, but is it real? In 1920, Wilson thought it was. And a good percentage of the American people did so too. But the war ended, and now, that was the biggest accomplishment that whatever you say about Wilson in the aftermath, that he failed to get us into the League of Nations, never forget that he ended he basically was the spur that ended World War I. <clears throat> he was the moral force, and there was a part of people <coughs> that needed an unreal person in order to lead them into the good. And those people that died in France from the United States believed in them, and they believed in Wilson's cause. So give Wilson his due. The unfortunate thing is that before he ended his presidency, he returned to America and he suffered a stroke. A concussion, And he is looked on now as a man who didn't succeed because he put himself into such a position of moral belief and what he was doing. He was like a soldier, not fighting a war, but he trained, taxed his strength. 
And he then became a casualty because he exerted himself to such an extent that he undermined it and he had a series of thrombosis. In 1918, in 1918, uh, in 1919, in April 1919, he suffered a thrombosis while he was in Europe. He was in Europe basically from uh, 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 the end of 1918, December 1918 to, to, uh, to June of 1919. He spent three days in the United States. His whole core of being was to create a world peace movement. Why was the President of the United States? He neglected and he felt he had an overriding obligation. He neglected the United States' problems. The domestic, the war ended, soldiers returned, couldn't find jobs. The railroad companies still were not turned over to the private people that owned them. Because he was in Europe and he was so involved and you can shake your head, but he was, he was doing what he felt he had to do. He had to be there, and his presence did affect a lot of the things that were done in Europe, and where he was completely uninvolved with Europe before that. Now he became solely involved in it. He was a one-man the thing is that he was very practical when he won the war. He was a very good leader. He was a very good leader when the war was on. And fortunately for him, the war ended at just the right moment because of promulgations that he said we should end the war right then and there. And they did because then, coincidentally or not, the war ended because Lincoln, Wayne Wilson said it should end at that time. And, he, and it was the right moment for the war to end. So it became, in many ways, a man that saw his proclamations becoming true, even though they were in a fairy tale land. Now, if you have this attitude that things can be done because I'm President of the United States, even if it wasn't just because, you know, that the people will follow me, he also believed that it would amount to nothing. That why did these troops die? Why did these troops die if not to end all wars? Because the war, his aim was different from England's aim. His aim was different from France's aim. His aim was to end all wars. England just wanted to remain alive. The United States wasn't threatened in World War I. He only saw it as an end to, but he said to himself, this will be a situation where if it doesn't, maybe in World War II, we will not survive, but there's another World War II. So he took his priorities and he took it over there. <clears throat> then he suffered a stroke, uh, a, 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 a thrombosis. In April 19, while he was over in Paris, they thought he had influenza. His personality changed completely. He was now suspicious of everybody. He was now, he, didn't, he thought he was being poisoned in Paris. He became, a, and people thought it was influenza because it was part of the influenza epidemic in 19, everybody was dying of influenza. So his doctor diagnosed it as overstrained nervousness and influenza. Never getting a biopsy to show it was not influenza. <clears throat> He went back, and I told him he was treated like a god over there, but the country was not now for him. The country was tired. It was a man who was proselytizing all the time, a preacher. We don't need a preacher anymore. The people that died for him, the soldiers that died for him, and the belief in the world ended. 
Now people wanted to, as Harding had it in 1920, return to normalcy. And here was a man who was telling him things aren't any longer normal. But he came back and he was treated. And I told you that there was an election just before the, where he, the Republicans got into power. And he did not treat the party, but he was not important to him. He didn't treat the Republican Party as part of, uh, as part of his, uh, uh, as part of the people that were fighting the war. And the Republican Party started to turn against him. And they said that they would not support a league because it would take away the independence of the yeah, right to declare war by, if we got entered into a league, that we would lose. Why is it that we won this war? Why are we losing all our power of independence? Why are we giving up our power of independence and ask, because Wilson is saying so, and joining a league, a world league, to end all wars where we could be controlled by Germany or France, the people that, or, or Germany or whoever defeated, or we defeated, we defeated. And you know, Wilson was the type of personality that could not be friendly. He couldn't josh. He was always the preacher. He created that distance between him and the Republican Party. But he still felt that there was a right out there that had to be worked on. And what did he do? He went on a campaign because he saw that they were, remember I told you Republicans had won the majority in the state senate. He couldn't get his league accepted. So he says to himself, he's got now a thrombosis. He's got pains in his, from the, what happened in 1919 in April. Now he's back in September, uh, I mean July and August, and he says to himself, I've got to get the people behind me. I've got to get out of Washington. What does he do? He takes a train. He travels from Washington, D.C., out west. And what does he do? He's campaigning every night on the railroad. He's got a thrombosis. He's got, he's got pain. He's got, he doesn't know he has a thrombosis. He's out there. He thinks it's just nervous exhaustion. He says, I've got to hire a I've got to help the soldiers that died for me. <coughs> he said, for me. The soldiers died for me, for what I stood for. They're out there in France, buried. I have to do this for that. I have to end all wars. <clears throat> okay, I wanted that. Now I'm going to go more into what happened on that train ride. He goes out to. He goes out to California. Crowds are not as large as he'd like them to be. He suddenly, now he's getting a lot of crowds in California. People are coming to him, and the people are now. They're, 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 remember, the country was probably divided in their heads. Some were for getting into the league. It was not, they didn't have opinion polls anywhere in 1918, 1919. Wilson thought the people would all tell the Congress. that they should join the league. And if you couldn't get Congress directly, he was doing it indirectly by talking to the people. He's out. Now he's, every night, he's traveling by coach. He's talking about 15 hours a day. He's got the, uh, the, 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 the jostling of the train, the, uh, the, the heat, the, 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 the going over the west. It's cold. It's, it's now September. And he gets into California. Now he's returning to, he's got an idea of doing this for 30, 30 days. He leaves on, I think he leaves on September 3rd. It's now September 27th, 1919. He's just gone back from California. He's now back in, he's gone through Nevada. He's gone through Wyoming. And now he's in Colorado. He's in Pueblo, Colorado. And he gets off, and there are 15,000 people in the arena. And there's 100,000 people in, 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 in nearby, on the roadsides. He really starts to believe the people are for him. He gets up, he makes his last speech before he gets his second thrombosis on September 27th. His last words 
where he's the one who's still healthy, and the only one who's nervous and social. I thought were well, is probably the last legible words that he made, where he didn't suffer from a terribly crippling paralysis. And he says in Pueblo, Colorado at night, in front of 15,000 people, they seem to be these last words, it seems to me to stand between us and the rejection of this treaty, the serried ranks of the boys in Cappy, not, not only those boys who came home, but those ghosts, he doesn't say souls, he says ghosts, because he is ghost, he is haunted, but those ghosts who still deploy upon the fields of France. And he suffers a very sharp attack and his wife, I mean sharp pain in his head, and his wife has to escort him down the platform. She's up there with him. And now he's got to go into the train. And the next day he's going to be in Wichita, Kansas. He's in Pueblo, Colorado. And then again, there's about 100,000 people in Wichita, Kansas that are looking forward to him to be there. It's seven or eight in the morning. He gets into the Pullman train. And at 11.30 at night, his wife, his wife is about to go to bed. She has a knock on the door. And he says, he says, Edith, help me. I can't seem to raise my left hand. And she goes in, and he's, he's, he's on a bed. He's sitting on a bed. And she says, he can't raise his left hand, he can't, he can't move his left foot. And what is he doing? She calls for the doctor, Dr. Grayson, the doctor that had been his best friend, his companion. And Grayson comes in, and then and there knows he's got it because he has suspicions. This man is suffering from a second thrombosis. You know, that the first one, I just misdiagnosed, was influenza. This one is, is thrombosis. He can't move his left part of his body. And he's dribbling water, saliva down his throat, and he can't raise his jaw. He can't do any talk. And what is he saying? I've got to go on. She, she says, you've got to rest. You, we've got to. And the doctor says, you have to go home. And she says, I refuse to go home. If I go home, they'll call me a quitter. You go, my doctor, call me a quitter. i got to go on. Otherwise, Lodge, he's always thinking about his enemy Lodge. Lodge will think I'm a quitter. Tumulti comes in. Tumulti is his secretary, Joseph Tumulti. And Grace, they both tell him, you have to go home. We have to stop this trip. Doesn't stop him. Then his wife he comes to him and says, which of you have to go home? And the one person he listened to was his wife. They get on the back, they get up, they get on the train. They get on the train and 48 hours, they travel 1,700 miles. They cancel all the train, the train travel. And they get in on Sunday morning, September 27th, 1919. And they send out a, 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 a bulletin. They don't say that he suffered a thrombosis. Because Wilson said, don't say it. And his wife said, don't say it. Because if they say that, it'll be a concession. A concession. That large one. That he went out there, and he suffered a thrombosis. Instead of looking at it, he should have said it. People would be sympathetic to him. All they looked at is he was a failure. He had the thrombosis, and that would be a, he would be a quitter. So why did he tell his wife and he decided to do? His wife was basically controlling Woodrow Wilson's mind because Woodrow Wilson, in 1919, didn't have a mind. He was completely out of it. He was unconscious for maybe 22 hours for the day. He couldn't, he couldn't, um, in, the, in the first, he was lying, he couldn't sleep. 
not unconscious. He was conscious, but he was in terrible, terrible pain. And he relied on his wife, and his wife and suggested to the doctor, who was his friend, who was also, but still a doctor, and to Tumulti, that we do not, Tumulti said we should tell Dr. Edith Bowling, a woman who two years before, three years before, had never been involved in politics, who had two years of, she had four years of high school training and maybe two years of, of she didn't have a degree in anything, she was basically telling the president what to do and what to say. And he, as a man, and there was, was as, as, a, as a man who was so ill, was relying solely on her. And his voice was still coming out. His voice was still coming out. But was the voice controlled by his wife's thoughts? And he said, don't tell. And he's still the president of the United States. So you listen to him. There isn't a mechanism like there is probably now. Well, there was one. Yeah. Oh. What do we do when the president's the same? In fact, back in 1881, there was a president that was killed, Garfield. And Congress wasn't in session. And his secretary, Garfield, the secretary ran the presidency for two months until he died. Basically, the country didn't want to know about it. They were not in on it. They weren't, they were, there was a return to normalcy to most, to many of the people. They wanted, they didn't want, they were not in on Wilson in 19, many of the people. He had a support, but he, people were trying to return to a different, and Wilson represented a different belief than what these people wanted to do. The people of America in those days didn't want a leader. They didn't, they wanted to be left alone. They wanted to forget about World War I. And there wasn't this there wasn't the internet, there wasn't any of these things we have today where we watch everything. Wilson was basically alone, and he was left alone. And his wife, basically, was running the government. And he was still the President of the United States. Well, it's good that you bring this up because it could happen again. And not only could it happen again, but it happened once before with Jimmy Carter. He was supposed to give a speech about the, uh, the energy problems of the country. And the room waited for the speech, the speech never came, and, and Rosalind Carter had to uh, run everything. She, 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 I she didn't, I didn't the, know that. She handled the, uh, the, 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 the press and everything. Uh -huh. He was, he was, he was, he was, um, he was out of it. Warren left. What was wrong with him? You know? um, he was depressed. Oh, okay. He was depressed and uh, he, couldn't, he couldn't make the speech. He, they led up to it, and every, every, the, the news brought up TV, radio, were you making up to it? And well, I, it? I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe you're right, and maybe you're not. I don't know, but you, you could be. I'm not saying you're not. I, I'm going back. You know, I'm bringing this up now because there was definitely a situation here where everybody, it is in a circle, could not be with her. Everybody but his wife. Can you believe that? Not even to Tumulti. His right hand man who was with him on his trip, he was excluded by his wife. She did not like Tumulti. He was basically alone all the way. His wife was not political, but her aim was not to isolate, her aim was not to run the country. Her aim was not to run the country. Her aim was to get her husband better. And in her mind, and in her mind, if he wasn't disturbed by anything, his mind would get better and he would recover. She loved him in a strange way. And he loved her and he loved he was now in pain, but he always looked, he always looked to her for his support. I mean, not always, because he only was married, giving it better three years. But the four year, three or four years, when he was leader of the world, the one person he would talk to was his wife. 
when he was leading the world, when he was capable. Now he's incapable. And now he's resting on her. And there was a part of him, why do I talk so much? I, talk, I want to talk about the significance of Wilson, but I also want to show you the power that came to Wilson to explain maybe why in his the mental state of triple uh, 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 inability, he would rely on his wife telling everybody that things are all right. Why? Because he was still the President of the United States. He wasn't automatically removed. And just like he stopped World War I, he said to himself, all I have to do is get better. And I will become the world leader again. And after all, what I've accomplished. He doesn't say this out loud. He doesn't write this. I am speculating on this because Wilson was completely crippled mentally. But he still knew he was president. He still could articulate that he's president. But I'm a crippled president. But I can get better. Because the doctor kept saying, you need rest. And he believed it. And he said, oh, and what does he do? He, the presidency goes into suspended. It's dead. And the world doesn't know it. Because it let his newspaper articles coming out from a saying that he's getting better every day. And he's suffering from nervous exhaustion. Not that he has a stroke. Suffering from nervous exhaustion. Took, brought on by, and he lies to the, the doctor. Brought on by, because now he knows that he didn't suffer from influenza. Brought on by influenza back in April 1919. Now in September, October, he comes into the presidency. He comes into Washington, D.C. On September 20th, they take the 1,700-mile trip. They get in on Sunday morning. And now, all these crowds, I told you there were 100,000 people waiting for him in, 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 in Wichita, Kansas. He speeds through, he gets into St. Louis, the train gets into St. Louis. He, the one person that he's close to is a Secret Service agent. I um, can't remember his name right now. Anyway, he was planning to get off in St. Louis to see his mother, the Secret Service agent. And Wilson says to him, get off. You know, he just had this one guy that was very close to him in the Secret Service. Get off. You don't have to stay. And, and Wilson, uh, in his collapsed mind, tells his wife to give him a gift. And she gives him a shawl. And, a, and he says, I'll meet you in Washington, D.C. He gets off. And he, he, but meanwhile, he can't sleep. He's, he's in pain all the time. He can't sleep. He's restless. He's, he's in terrible pain. And, but he's told that all you need is rest. So he's trying to rest, he can't rest. He's in a terrible state of pain and disability. He gets into the he gets into Union Station in Washington, D.C. on September 27th at 9 or 10 o'clock in the morning, and there are people that heard the train is going into Washington, D.C. So they're coming out. The people of Washington, D.C., the people of that area, coming out to see him. They know he's ill. He gets into, they hide the fact that he can't move, and they put him in a, in a Secret Service car, but they can't hide the route. And he gets into the back seat of the car, and really there's nobody there watching him, although they're, they're trying to see him, but they can't. And one or two or three people can see him. And what does he do? He's cheering, and there's nobody there except these one or two or three people. And they say to themselves, this guy has lost his mind. He's cheering. He's waving to people that aren't there. Because he couldn't eat all these. He's just going like this from the trip to Union Station. And a newspaper article comes out that he's lost his mind. Maybe he's lost his mind. Terrible rumors come about, you know, that he's this, he's that. He had a terrible situation. But that he hadn't lost his mind. But his mind wasn't there now. But he hadn't. And now, they look at the windows. He's on his bedroom window. And they see, although it had been there for a year, they see chains on this window. 
and they were speculating. He's trying to jump out the window. He's looking, he's in that bedroom, and there, there's a change there. They didn't realize it was there a year. But people started to question him. And in the beginning, Tumulti, the secretary, was permitted access to him on the train ride and on the way back. But then, so he comes and he says, that on Sunday, he says, after he's cheering to nobody, he says, I want to go to church. I go to church every Sunday. So I says, you can't go to church. You can't get out of the way. I'm not going to let you go to church. Says, okay, I won't go to church. They go on a ride, as they always did before, to Rock Creek Park. And he likes it. And he comes back and he starts to recover. His, not his, necessarily his mind, but his left side starts to get better. He's starting to move better. And so they are now encouraged. His, his people are looking for signs that he's getting better. Now, the doctor knew, but he closed his eyes, that once you get a thrombosis, you could have momentarily get better. But what happens is if you have it and you have a second one like you had, it's all downhill, basically downhill. Louis Pasteur had a thrombosis. Before he became, he did his greatest work. Two thirds of his brain was, and one third of his brain was gone, and yet he did his greatest work after he had his first thrombosis. But that's a rarity. Most people who have thrombosis, if you don't give them complete rest, could have a second thrombosis, and a third thrombosis. But Grayson, Carrie Grayson, the doctor, didn't do that. He called in four or five other doctors. They all came in, and they all said it is basically probably a, you know, a, a thrombosis. But they kept it quiet. They said it's nervous exhaustion, rest. All these four or five doctors, nervous exhaustion. Then on December 2nd, when he's getting better, no, I'm not the subset. I'm October 2nd. Forgive me. I started September. October 2nd, five days later, he's in the bathroom at 9, 7 o'clock. He hadn't slept. All of a sudden, he collapses and goes unconscious. He's unconscious on, on October 2nd. October 2nd, they call for Grayson again. He comes in, says he's had his third thrombosis. Third, third thrombosis. Now he can't move his left side again. And it's really big. So what do they do? They tell everybody he needs rest. He's getting better every day, but he can't see anybody. And so from October 2nd to October 30th, he saw nobody but his wife. And maybe one or two times to multi. His separate. For 28 days, he didn't see anybody. On October 30th, he started to get better. At the end of October, he started to get better. And the people are crying out, where is Wilson? Where is Wilson? You know, they're not. But one thing I want to tell you before you get to October 30th. Who is the Vice President of the United States? Does anybody know? Where was the Vice President? Did you ever hear of the saying, what this country needs is a good life sense of God? <laughs> That's what he's famous for. He's also famous for not really, 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 the last thing he wanted to do, the last thing he wanted to do was to be President of the United States. The last thing he wanted to do was to be President of the United States. He was the Vice President in hiding. In hiding. His name is Thomas Marshall. He had been a small town, small town lawyer in Columbia, Indiana. And a year before 1912, he was thrown up, and I don't know how, he was, he was a type of guy that would love to sit. He was a lawyer, not a very successful one in a small town. He used to love to sit on a back store 
in a country store and talk with a cigar, always in his mouth. All he did was smoke cigars and talk half the day away to people <laughs> that were either, you know, that would come by and see these people, what are you doing? Ugh! And he'd sit down at the country store and he basically owned a seat on the country store, even though he didn't own the country store. He spent the whole day on the country store talking to people. He was the most on, he was from Indiana, and he got thrown into, he got, just like Wilson, because Wilson was, was well, well, they, they planned to put Wilson in the presidency when he ran for governor, the people that put him there. Marshall was put in, and nobody knew what he looked like, basically. He, would got, he was the type of guy, he was the type of guy that would go on trick. He said to himself, I have to make a living. I'm only making, I've got all these parties to go to, and I'm only making $15,000 a year as vice president. I've got to make a living. So he went to William Jennings Ryan, and William Jennings Ryan said to him, the only way you're going to make a living is if you go on a lecture tour. But make sure you get the money up front. Make sure you get the money up front because you might be on a lecture tour like William Jennings Ryan was, the IRA, and they won't give you any money. So he always said, pay in advance. That was his name, pay in advance, Tom Marshall. Give me a lecture, I'll go anywhere. And he would get on the trains, and nobody knew he was the vice president. He went up to a salesman one day. He was in the auto business. This is just about the time. This is just before this happened. And he made believe he was a drug dealer. He's, he's talking to this auto seller. So he says, what are you doing? He used to love to do practical jokes. He says, well, I'm, I'm in Washington, D.C. Nobody knew he was the vice president. I'm in Washington, D.C. And uh, what are you doing? Oh, I'm... I like to uh, hustle drugs. You got it? Oh no, I don't do that here. Okay. He would love to pull people's legs. When there was a, uh, right after this happened, he's still presiding in the Senate. And he says, I don't want to have anything to do with the vice president. They said, well, there was a, they, there was a big fight between Lodge and someone else. And what does Marshall do? What does Marshall do? He says, I got to, I got a letter from this person who says that if, if I want to name a daughter, I'll name my daughter to the highest bidder who gives me the most money to name my daughter. Just for, tell me what the price is. Give me how much. And he does this in the Senate. Crack a joke to make things lively. The guy was, and he says, they say to him, you know, you might become president of the United States. He says, there's no way I'm going to become president of the United States. He says, you're going to, you're going to become president. If you become president of the United States, fine. He says, but what would happen if Congress and, or the Supreme Court tell you you're going to be by, you have to be president of the United States? He says, if Wilson says I'm not president of the United States, I'm not going to be president of the United States because I can see it happening that Wilson will come back after three months after he, he recovered and there'll be, a, there'll be an usurpation, a, a, a civil war in the United States. I'm not going to become president of the United States. And besides, they don't pay me enough. Uh, do I have a few more minutes? Okay. So, nobody, because partly because Marshall doesn't want to know, but Marshall finally goes to the White House. And who does he see? He sees Edith Bowling, the wife. And he says, you know, what can I do? Can I see the president? She says, no, you can't see the president. He's busy. I mean, he's, he's yeah, okay. Finally, finally, after two or three months, I mean, I'm sorry, after, after about a month, <clears throat> the president is not getting better. Finally, there's a push to see what Marshall's going to do. Finally, the president, uh, the, the secretary, Tumulty, tells, he can't tell the vice president that Wilson is un basically not functioning. He hires a man from the Baltimore Sun. He gets a Baltimore Sun reporter and calls in Marshall in, uh, in the middle of November, early November, 1919. He says, I don't know. I think you should make plans. You might one day become, get a note that President Wilson is dead. And what does Marshall do when he hears this note? And he says, it's coming from the White House. I know I'm not from the White House, I'm from the Baltimore Sun. But 
what does he do? He gets into his, he gets into, he goes down, and he's in a trance. The, mom, the spice press, and he doesn't get up. He's in a trance. As he's like immobile. The entire Esri walks out the door and sees him. He's got his head in his hands. He can't accept the idea that he's going to become president of the United States. He refuses to make any move to become president of the United States. Uh, okay, I, I think I'll end it here. <laughs> All right, I, 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 want, I want, in the next two, two sessions, I'm going to be talking about Wilson's incapacities. The reason I brought up so much, the first part, is I don't want you to ignore the impact this man had on America before his incapacity. However, I think that it's so important for us to realize that for a year and a half, well, not enough a year and a half. Yes, in 1920, March 1920, Harding takes over. Woodrow Wilson, he had no president. He basically had no. He gets better. He gets better. And he's able to, but his cabinet has not seen him. He went away on a train in July or in August. It's now of 1919. It's now, you know, November 18th, they're meeting, the cabinet is meeting without his approval. The Secretary of State is calling without his knowledge or approval, and they're in the executive office building, and on November 18th, they see for the first time that he's alive. For all you know, he could have been dead for two months. They see a man coming down in an elevator, escorted by Tumulti, and by his wife, and by the doctor. And he's in a shawl, and he's in a wheelchair. And they look out at the South Portico, the whole cabinet says, he is alive! <laughs> November 18th, he had been away, what did I say, July? They had no opportunity for them to come in. And say to the president, I hope you're feeling better, Mr. President. Are you getting better? His wife kept saying, and they kept saying, and why did they do that? Because they all knew that if they went in to see the president, they couldn't cover themselves up with how the hell could he be the president, still be the president. He was like a dead man. This is how this country was being run. Okay. There were reports or stories that I've read that Edith ran the country. I'm sorry. She was taking She did not run the country. Okay. Nothing was being done. Absolutely nothing. The government had to do everything, making believe he was still the president. They had, she didn't know anything, but she did contribute. Unlike his first wife, she did contribute to his thinking that there are people out to get him. And she did isolate him. Because she thought for his sake, for his sake, the only way, she said, I'm not here to run this country. I'm here to get my husband better.